Okay, it says I'm live. And so I'm glad that um, I deleted this because there was actually another video um, saying that I was going to go live. And I didn't realize that. So I'm glad that Raymond came on here from the Netherlands and told me. So um, I had two choices today. I had, well, I had a lot more than two choices, I guess. But um, I had a choice between a Syrian or somebody from Armenia that lived in Syria that's a professional photographer to hold my camera for um, 20 bucks or the girl that lives down the hall for 10 bucks. All right. <laughs> I say, let's do the 10 bucks. Normally, I don't hire people. Um, I normally don't hire people to hold my camera. But um, I have been out on the, hey, Bruce, I've been out on the streets. Uh, today will be three days in a row. And so I've actually done a lot of outreaches this year that haven't been filmed. I just randomly walked through the city and was singing with my microphone and uh, preaching as I go. You know, Matthew 10 says, preach as you go. So the past couple of days I've been out there and uh, been singing and I didn't want to put up with the camera because every time I film, because it's high quality I have to stick the computer chip in my laptop. I have to wait for all of it to download. And then I have to wait for it to download for the second time because it's high quality. And then I have to edit the videos. And then I have to save the videos. And then I have to upload them. So you can imagine... Uh, I've been doing this over seven uh, and a half years, and sometimes I just don't feel like it. And that's why it's easier for me to just go live because there's no editing. So I got up today, and I saw Pastor K in uh, Tokyo, and I was like, oh, man, I wish I was preaching today. <laughs> and I preached the last two days. And the police have done absolutely nothing to me, praise God. Which is weird because the police know me by name and they know me by my passport name, not my YouTube name. I always tell people my passport name so they don't find me on YouTube unless I want to be found on YouTube. So uh, Mary Cummings is different than Angela Cummings. So anyway, I got fired up. Pentecost. And I've been watching Pentecost videos lately. And it's like, I want to preach. I want to preach today. I want to preach. I, I would say an evangelist favorite holiday of the year would be today. Because evangelists are marked by the fire of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Evangelists are known for fire. Um, if you ever meet an evangelist that's not marked by fire, they're probably not an evangelist. <laughs> because we're known for the fire of the Holy Ghost. And so, matter of fact, when I was called to preach, uh, when I was called to preach, Steve Hill laid hands on me. He pointed at me through a crowd of people at the Brownsville Revival, February 27th, uh, 1999. And he said, come here. Scared me so bad because I actually drove all the way there for him to pray for me. So when he pointed at me and called me out, I knew it was not Steve Hill calling me out. It was God calling me out. And so he put his hand on my head when I walked over there. He went, he was in a crowd of people around him. And he reached through the crowd of people, 
put his hand on my head and shouted fire. Whoa. And if you don't know, I have a burning bush tattoo because of that very day, because God baptized me in the fire. John the Baptist baptized people with water. But he said, there's one coming that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with the fire. So today is uh, the day where the fire of God fell on everybody in the upper room. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and began to speak in other tongues. And uh, the Jews, the Jewish men are commanded by Jewish law to be in Jerusalem during uh, this time frame. So it's a Jewish holiday, but it's now a Christian holiday. So it was 49 days plus one day after Passover, okay? So the Jews are celebrating uh, the Torah, uh, the giving of the Torah. And so the Jewish men, um, that's why when Peter went out to preach on, on that Sunday, 50 days after Passover, that's why the Jewish men were saying in the book of Acts that they that there were many languages being spoken. Yes, Pink Sternman. Hallelujah. You know, Gert Wilders even posted on Facebook today, Pink Sternin. He used the word happy before it, which I don't know how to use that word happy yet. If you want to write it in Dutch, I'm going to learn Dutch little by little. Praise God. But today is a day for me to go preach. Hallelujah. I got my fire clothes on. I even got my orange pantyhose on. <laughs> Ain't messing around today. I got my I got my fire clothes on, and I might put my Tokyo red fire hat on if I feel like it. But <clears throat> I have hired the girl down the hall. She's living in the the female dorm. I have hired her for ten U.S. dollars to work for me two hours. Hallelujah! You know what's crazy, Raymond? is I loved orange for years before I knew it was the color of Holland. I'm not kidding. When I think about how God has prepared me for Holland, like my whole life, it's really, really strange. So, whoa. My first missions trip to Germany. True story. S in Germany, Steve Hill. 20 years ago, I was wearing an orange jacket and orange shoes. I'm not joking. It's so weird, like, to think about how I, and you know what my home state color is? Orange. Tennessee is orange. Yeah. Well, I've been going to Holland for, for eight years, and it's uh, it's really strange because my Bible school, um, 
we called one of our buildings the blue and we called another one of our buildings the orange because of the carpet. There was blue carpet in one place and orange carpet in the main sanctuary at my Bible school. So my Bible school colors are blue and orange. I didn't know until later that the Netherlands is blue and orange. So I've always worn blue and orange for my Bible school. And the mark of my Bible school is sending the fire to the nations. That was our motto because we were in the fire of revival. I went to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry for four years. And who, when we graduated, we would always walk out to the song, Send the Fire. I need to put that on my iTunes today. Shoo, Holy Ghost. I need to sing that today. I'm in a fiery, fiery mood, and um, I feel like casting out some devils and um, all kinds of good stuff. <laughs> so I'm sure they're warning this girl that is going to work for me. I'm sure they're warning her right now. You need to see her videos before you go out there. <laughs> They do. They watch my videos. And a lot of times I go to hostels, they end up watching my videos. They watch my videos over there in Santorini, Greece. I would be on a live and they would be watching me across the across the, uh, the place. Yeah, I know Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey, yeah. I was actually in Germany for the World Cup. What year was that? 2014. Unforgettable. I'm wearing an Israel hat. And I'm wearing a Jesus Saves from Hell t-shirt. And uh, I show up at 10 o'clock at night, which was not wisdom. And I'm just thinking there's a crowd. And that's the way I have done my ministry many, many times over the years is, oh, there's a crowd over there. Well, I'm going over there to preach. Like if I were in America right now, a few years ago, not right now because I've changed. I've got more wisdom. But if I were in America, and the riots were breaking out, you would see me there. I would get in my car and I would drive to one of these riots and you would see me on the news preaching in the middle of that because that's the kind of stuff I lived for, man, is riots. There was a big riot that broke out in my hometown and um, I was right in the middle of it. And of course, there were many, many police officers that were hired just to be at my crusade. About uh, eight, over eight of them and the head police of Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, he, he was even assigned to my crusade because so much was happening and riots breaking out. Somebody got arrested while I was preaching instead of me being arrested. It's usually the preacher arrested. But instead of me arrested, there was somebody else arrested and it started a big riot in my hometown. And I was on the news every day, front page of the paper two times. I mean, a Sunday paper is a big deal. If you make the Sunday paper, uh, it's a big deal. And I was like on the whole front page. Uh, when was it? November 24th, 2013. And I, it was kind of funny because my dad reads the paper every single day when he was alive. So I told my dad the day before, I said, Dad, uh, I'm going to be in the paper tomorrow. 
thought I should warn you. He said, oh, okay, like that. <laughs> and I couldn't even stay with my family at the time because I was causing such a huge stir in my hometown and it was too cold to live in my car. So I was forced to get hotels because there wasn't anybody else opening their home for me. Oh, you're, you're a missionary reaching the whole city for Jesus here. Come stay with me. Ain't nobody open their home for me. I'm telling you right now, I had to go to Days Inn <laughs> Hotel. So I, I don't know why I'm telling this story. But anyway, I am. So the next morning, I run down at Days Inn to get the, the Sunday paper. And I grab it, open it up, see myself on the whole front page of the paper. It freaked me out. And it was uh, her cross to bear, the woman trying to save you, T.C., and because of that, uh, somebody sent me, I think, $400. It, it was a great vindication, honestly. It wasn't the greatest vindication of my ministry. I just had the greatest vindication of my entire ministry last week. I wish I could tell you what happened, but just trust me on that. It happened the other day, and it was long overdue like eight years overdue, okay? So uh, God vindicated me the other day. And I would say that this was a big vindication, making the front page of the paper. But it, it wasn't totally because there were 16 mistakes in that article. Okay. Hi there. Hello, Michael. Michael the Archangel. So, um, Defender of Israel. Shoo, I feel God today. And I'm going to preach uh, later at 5 o'clock. It is uh, a little after 2.30 here. But I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. And, and I think I'm not going to just preach Pentecost. I think I'm going to preach the different places in the Bible where the fire of God fell. And I really feel uh, compelled yeah, to preach um, uh, Elijah in the, the fire that fell on Mark, Mount Carmel. All right. I could be wrong. You know, yesterday, uh, because, and I could say, I could be wrong because what happens, let me explain. What happens when you go street preach, you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. You throw out your plans. I mean, it's good to have a plan, but you throw out your plans. And you just go in the power of the Holy Spirit because you don't know what's going to happen. You can't pre-plan what God has planned. That's good preaching. You can't pre-plan what God has planned. Okay, so I don't know. I might raise the dead today. I don't know what's going to happen. All right. You're in Liverpool. Do you know how many people watch my channel from Liverpool? You're like the third person. That is so, that's just wild to me. How many people from Liverpool watch? But, uh, shoo. I love Acts chapter 2. I took the book of Acts uh, class. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. I, I really am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing great. You know, I've walked with the Lord over 20-something years. And, um... I'm determined more and more to trust in him because God has not forsaken me. God has taken tremendous amount of care of me and in my life. And I just see him moving. I see God moving. And I know how much God loves lost souls. I've been wrestling with a guy on my channel for days and days and days. I, I typically won't 
argue the scripture with somebody for that many days unless God is like giving me a burden like don't let this fish go keep going keep nailing this fish and then today I had to let the fish go let it go back in the water <laughs> and prayed you know Well, this is a really good time uh, to, to reset today. Today is a good day to reset and say, you know what? I'm going to walk in the fire of God. I'm not going to be lukewarm. I'm not going to be half in, half out. I'm, I'm all yours, God. I'm going to be all yours. Um, I have grieved my journey at times. Because I did not understand what the Holy Spirit was doing in the timing of the Lord. And when I think about the book of Ecclesiastes 3. It says there's a time for everything. And then it explains times. God's time is not like our time. And it says God makes everything beautiful in his time. That there will be an end of seasons and new beginnings. So... I am in Armenia, and Armenia, uh, a lot of times when I'm in a taxi in this city, I'll be going down the road, and I'll look over, and I'll see Mount Eret, and I'll just, the joy of the Lord hits me, because I'm in a taxi. I'm not in an ark. I'm in a taxi going somewhere. So those of you that are just upset about being quarantined too long or on hold too long, just remember God lets you out to go exercise, go to the store, ride your bike, go to the mall. The malls are open now. I've been singing during this quarantine in Armenia. I just don't post it. I've been out singing the past two days with, with so many police walking by me. But Noah landed on Mount Eret in that ark. And he didn't get out of that boat for 150 days, people. 150 days. Amen. Amen. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's see. Yeah, I, I like preaching in Liverpool, too. I'm saying amen to Raymond uh, in the Netherlands, but, you know, amen to you over there in Liverpool. Liverpool is one of those cities. I tell people. If you have a youth group and you want to go preach the gospel overseas for a good missions trip, go to Liverpool. I've told churches that because Liverpool has a great open air preaching spot. And I would say uh, teenagers would have a blast in Liverpool. Yes, I've been to Australia, Perth. Adelaide, Melbourne, Ballarat, Sydney. Yeah. I told somebody that in Australia once uh, that I met somewhere in the world. They said, you've been more places in Australia than I have. <laughs> that happens a lot. I'll meet people and they're like, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. God pays for it.
I really have been everywhere, pretty much. I mean, when you look at the map of Italy, I've been all over Italy. I have literally almost done the whole shoe of just Italy. Germany, I've been up and down Germany. Now the Netherlands, I've done a lot of the Netherlands in the past few years because God sent me all over Holland fasting and praying for the country. I'm fired up today. Let let me read let me read part of the book of Acts uh, for Pentecost. I will be going to the streets later today, and I will be filming. I have hired somebody uh, to go with me for a couple hours because the past few days I've gone out, many many people have been sitting down and listening to me, and I haven't bothered taking my camera. I haven't cared. But today I just feel this like a uh, part of the Holy Spirit, like I need to document it. And sometimes I document because I reach more people on the Internet than I do in person. I know that. There's nothing wrong with that. Your fishing pole needs to be in several places. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And if I say something controversial, which I typically do, and sometimes I do it on purpose. If I say something controversial, for instance, you need Jesus more than you need toilet paper. Let me tell you something about me. I knew when I said that, that it would provoke people. On the internet. And what happened was. When I said. You need Jesus more than you need toilet paper. It caused the friendly atheist. Which is very very popular. He's written about me several times. He follows my channel. He wrote about me in Hong Kong. America. Switzerland. Armenia. And one other place, I can't remember. But he wrote about me. Showed my video. Showed my channel. Talked about Jesus and toilet paper. Look, I said it on purpose. People love that kind of stuff. I know that. I've been doing this 19 years. If you say something controversial, you might make the news. Do you want to be on the news? Well, yeah. There were people out walking around here yesterday with a briefcase that said The Voice, Armenia. And I was like, man, I'd love to be on The Voice, Armenia. Hallelujah. That would be nice if I could do that before I leave. Hopefully, I get to leave this country in less than two weeks. Praise the Lord if I do. If I don't, then these people are stuck with me. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing and mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. When were they filled with the Holy Ghost? Right then. Whoa. And began to speak with other tongues. So first they were filled with the Holy Ghost. After they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So that's why I said a few minutes ago, it's commanded by law that the Jewish men 
go to Jerusalem for this holiday. So the Jewish man, Israel would be a super awesome place to preach today. Man, to be a street preacher in Israel today. Oh, that would be awesome. Why? Because this year was a literal Passover. There has not been a Passover like this year since the Bible Passover. Praise God. Think about that. So what if there's a literal uh, Pentecost today? There are a lot of prophets. I'm not talking about YouTube prophets. I'm talking about, you know, seasoned prophet that have records. Not single moms trying to pay their bills. They can hear from God too. I'm just making a point. Seasoned prophets are saying that this will be a literal Pentecost. The Bible says, uh, Apostle Paul talked about, I wish you to all prophesy. So it's good when the body of Christ is prophesying. I'm a single mom too. They say that they can build the third temple without destroying the body. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that. Um, no, I don't know. I don't know. I, please don't send me messages. I, I would need to know your character first. I'm sorry, I don't know you, so please, I'm not. I'm not open to receiving messages from you. I'm sorry, and, and let me explain why. Because a lot of people think they have messages for me. And they're wrong. So I'm not open to that, uh, brother, over there in Liverpool. I'm not open to receiving uh, prophetic instructions from somebody I don't know. I need to know you, know your character, and things like that. And I say that from experience. You're just an angel. You sound weird, to be honest. Yeah, you sound weird, okay? Just saying. I get a lot of weirdos on my channel. <laughs> I do, come on. It's not God's will. You keep running your mouth, I will block you. Don't be a weirdo. All right, let me keep going. Verse 6, and when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed. Who was amazed? This is your first time on my channel. And you're demanding I listen to you and you act like I'm the one that needs to be humbled. No, you need to humble yourself and be quiet. All right. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how... Here we, every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. And then it lists all the countries that were there. Um, verses 9 through 11. Verse 12 says, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, What does this mean? Others mocking, saying, These men are filled with new wine. 
verse 14. But Peter, but Peter, yes, I'm reading from Acts chapter 2 about Pentecost. But Peter, standing up. Now remember, they all received the Holy Spirit sitting down. But Peter stood up. All right? Peter stood up. Peter, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell at Jerusalem, be it this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that. Somebody say this is that. This is that. This is that. Spoken by the prophet Joel. You know, when I went to the Brownsville Revival years ago, uh, they had t-shirts. They did. They had t-shirts that says, this is that. And I bought one. Man, I wore that shirt so much. It was like my favorite t-shirt. This is that. So it's talking about uh, the book of Acts, the book of Acts. This is that. And it was the Brownsville revival was very, very powerful. And um, we would have church till one o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. But when it first started, they would have church until the sun came up. Can you imagine I'm here to let others know you're of the Lord, not my angel. I think if people are here, they they're here because they they want to be here. I don't need your endorsement. Oh my goodness. Um Okay, so then he goes on down and gives prophecy from the book of Joel. And then it talks about uh, verse 21. And it came to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Very easy scripture to preach. Hey, listen up, everybody. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Look, if you've got that bullet in your gospel gun, you can fire that anywhere at any time, whether it be at a stoplight. Hey, you roll your window down. I do that to people all the time in traffic. I talk to random people in, in cars next to me all the time. Why? Because I'm a talker. I like to talk. And I like to pick on people and shock people like, oh, what? why would this woman talk to me in traffic? Because it's weird and it's different. And I just feel like it. Okay, basically, I feel like it. So, hey, you, roll your window down. So they roll their window down. What's she going to say now? You know, perfect time to go. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's so random. You know, I used to get people to roll their window down for other stupid stuff. You know what I'm saying? Back in the day before Jesus going to the bars, getting drunk. I was always looking for a cool new story to tell. You know, the Bible talks about sinners, fools. Fools think sin is a sport. Think about that. Hello. Sinners, fools, think Sinning is a sport. 
He's bored. Why do you think there's protest going on right now? I'm sure there's people out there truly grieving for this man's death. I don't doubt that. But then there's the, the heathen. The people that are just don't care, have no vision, have no character, have no daddies, been through some stuff, and they just want to go blow up a building just to watch it burn down. It has nothing to do with that man that died by a white cop. It's just sinners wanting to sin because it's a sport for them. Okay? And it's attacking City Hall in Nashville. Oh, it's lagging. Well, my question is, what does City Hall in Nashville have to do with Minnesota? And you know what? Let me add this. They don't even care enough to cover up their face. At least the people in Hong Kong had enough common sense to put on a mask. Fools are not too smart. They don't care. Thank God for the book of Proverbs. Because God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Not many noble are called. 1 Corinthians 1 says. But that doesn't mean just because you used to be a whacked out foolish person. That God wants you to stay foolish. If you lack wisdom, ask. God chose me because I was whacked out and foolish. There's no doubt about it. If anybody's wondering why God called me. Because I was one of those people down there in the crack projects. Running around. Pumping gas. Driving off. Getting drunk. Taking my bra off. Swinging it around my head at the bar and throwing it. That's who I was before Jesus. And God's like, oh, yeah, one day, woman, you're going to work for me. <laughs> oh, my gosh, you are so weird. You are so weird. Yeah, seriously. Seriously. Woo! I'm telling you. You know what happens when you preach on the fire? Bugs are attracted to the light. Oh my goodness. Woo! Help me, Jesus. I'll probably be getting an email from this one. All right. We'll put you in spam. We'll put you in spam. If you write me, 
I will most likely spam you, so please don't bother me. I get the weirdest people on my channel. Now, all of you are not weird, okay? But I do get some weirdos, for real. God chooses the foolish things of this world, confounds the wise, but you know what? He doesn't. Ex he expects us to grow in wisdom. There's a book of Proverbs. That's why he says, if you lack wisdom, Solomon wanted wisdom. Give me wisdom. And you know what? It's not okay to stay a fool. Jason Upton wrote this song called Fool's Turn to Gold. I love that song. Matter of fact, I have a video of me in Greece from 2013 with that song in the background. It's such a good song. God taking fools and turn them into gold. So God wants us to walk in wisdom. God wants us to walk in power. God wants us to walk in the, prof the prophetic gifting, prophesied of people. Yeah, he does. God wants us to prophesy to people. God wants us to walk in the supernatural. I had a good time yesterday preaching. And... Uh, my, my microphone finally went dead after a few hours. I turned it off and I, I just started preaching. And there was somebody up in this restaurant that was like, come here, come here, come here. I was like, what's up? So I come back to my, my hostel and I asked the worker, I said, what does this mean in Armenia? Because it might mean something else. He goes, Oh, they wanted you to come in the restaurant. I said, are you sure? Because I was like really preaching and singing over there, harassing people. <laughs> he goes, yeah, yeah, they wanted you to come in there. So you don't know. You know, uh, in America, when you do this, that means come here. It, it, it could have mean go away. So I don't know. That's why I asked. But I'm excited about going out there today. Praise God. And uh, I love I love uh, Pentecost. I love the fire of the Holy Spirit. I remember when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I had just got born again. Um, 1996. And uh, I asked my Baptist friend that I grew up with since I was a little girl. I said, you know what? I need a I need a church where I can shout. Okay, I need a church where I can uh, listen to some you know good music, rock and roll, not just the hymns. All right. And the third thing I asked for, and I've really changed. Okay, this was twenty something years ago, but when I got saved, I liked men with really, really long hair, 20-something years ago. I love that. That's I loved Molly Crew. I got a Molly Crew tattoo on my ankle. I loved Molly Crew that much. I named my son Nicholas after Nikki Six. <laughs> okay, so I asked my Baptist friend for a church I could shout that, that had rock music and the men had long hair. That's what I said. I said, do you know a church I could go to? She goes, I do. You need to go to the River of Life Church. So I went to the River of Life Church and the pastor was an ex-alcoholic. Prosperity preacher. Thank God for him. He ended up baptizing me in water. Um, but he helped me get baptized in the Holy Ghost, too. See, I was in the back of the church. 
and everybody was praying in tongues, and I was like Baptist growing up, so I didn't know what was going on. And I said, God, I got on my knees in the back of the church, and I said, God, they're praying like this. I need to pray like this because this is my church now. I didn't know anything. It was a grace from heaven. And the pastor was at the pulpit. I'm in the back on my knees praying, God, I need, I need this. And Pastor Kreider said, somebody in here is praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Open up right now. Open your mouth and begin to speak it out. And my eyes got big. I said, oh, man, he's talking to me. I opened my mouth, everybody, and I started speaking in tongues. Oh, shakarabakotarama shikarabakotarama. Oh, shakarabakotarama shikarabakotarama. Praise God! Whoa, fire, fire, fire. I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost that day. Thank you, Jesus. In that church, we had some Holy Ghost services. And I can remember First, seen anybody run in church? Blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. So when I found out you can run in church, I don't know. Let me just tell you, people. I was so excited that I was not drunk anymore. I was not crawling on the ground, smoking crack anymore, looking for crack rocks. Jesus set me free. Hallelujah. Holy Ghost. I went out there having sex with random men from bars, spending the night on pool tables with the owner of bars anymore, doing all kinds of crazy stuff in my sin because Jesus set me free. I needed a church that I could shout. I needed a church that I could run because the Bible says when you've been forgiven much, you love much. And I was so, so, so saved. Jesus so changed my life. You don't know just how bad I was. Jesus does. <laughs> My old crack smoking buddy does. Tommy. See, Tommy. Went to church with me. A few years ago when I was in Chattanooga. See, the preacher, the preacher at the church I took Tommy to see used to kiss me in the bathroom at the bar. Now he's born again and he's the preacher. I'm born again. I'm a preacher. And Tommy wasn't saved yet. So I took Tommy to church. So he, 
He's looking at a miracle. Preaching. And he's sitting next to a miracle. And, and, and Justin is given the altar call. And I'm like, come on, Jesus, drag our sinner friend to the altar. And he's resisting, resisting, resisting the Holy Spirit. I had a dream about Tommy and his brother. Come on, Jesus, save their souls, God. Save Tommy, save Butch. I used to smoke crack with both of them. Matter of fact, my last crack rock. Bush was in the back of the car with me and Tommy was the driver. Somebody else was with us too. I don't remember who it was. But that was July 31st, 1994. And by God's grace, I've never smoked crack again. So when people talk to me about why are you so loud? Why are you so passionate? Why would you live in your car man it's like the story of the guy that found a pearl in a field and he buys the whole field for the pearl look Jesus is worthy Jesus is worthy of it all. Jesus is worthy. Okay, girl. See you later. <laughs> well, if you ever go to Chattanooga, if, if you ever get a chance to run the church. I don't know if I run the church now. I'm like close to 50. <laughs> Maybe I would. I don't know. I feel 20 something right now. So age is a number. But, uh, oh, Holy Ghost. God, release your Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Ghost. God, pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. This grandma yesterday. In the name of Jesus. It keeps lagging, so I turn the air conditioning on. I don't know if it's lagging because of the air conditioning or what, but see you in Finland. Oh, see you, Finland. I thought you said you see you in Finland. That's why I was like, are you going to Finland? Um, Holy Ghost. All-consuming fire, you are our heart's desire. Living flame of love, come baptize us. Um, I think I have that song. I want to sing songs about the fire today. Who's in it? Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. I love the elderly people. My uncle was a Baptist minister in America, Uncle Dal. And my uncle used to be a minister to senior adults. So I grew up around old people. And I've always had a heart for old people because I know what it's like to be alone because I'm lonely. That's not why I'm getting married. Because I was lonely, I would have taken one of those proposals already. I've had seven proposals. Actually, eight proposals. But seven in one year, that's a lot of proposals. 
But if I was lonely, I would have taken one of the proposals. But yesterday I was walking by this old lady and she was sitting on a park bench like this. And she had her little mask on. And underneath her mask was this big old beard. I'm not joking. Like this woman had this thick, thick mustache and like this hair on her chinny, chin, chin. Yes, she did. And I was like, that woman is poor. And I want to sit beside her and love her. Even if she doesn't have a clue what the heck I'm saying or singing, the language of love is universal. A smile. <laughs> is universal. So no matter what country I go into, I can love people through presence. Listen to this. Presence evangelism. Pentecost is power evangelism. The presence of God Evangelism. Catch that. That's what that is. Pentecost is about the Holy Spirit showing up. I love when the Holy Spirit shows up when I preach. You're either going to have a revival or you're going to have a riot. You're going to have one of them. And a lot of times... There's like chaos and confusion. And people say, oh, if there's chaos and confusion, God's not there. Because the, the author of confusion is the devil. Let me tell you something. When demons are manifesting and going crazy, it's because the presence of God has showed up. Light is invading darkness. Boom. It's clashing, people, and it needs to clash. Because light belongs in darkness. I sat down next to the grandma yesterday with the beard. Sat next to her and sang to her. Just sang. Looked her in the eyes and spent time with her. And just loved on her. Smiled at her. Because you know what? She sits there all day long like this. And how many people walk by her with ice cream and don't stop? Some people are saved by fear. Some people are saved by love. All right? Somehow, some way, God can touch this woman's heart. Somehow, some way. I don't know how, but I trust God. Because the Bible says your steps are ordered of the Lord. And over the years when I travel and I see lonely people, sometimes I'll stop and I'll take their picture and then I'll show them that I took their picture because I want them to know somebody in this world notices they're alive. And let me tell you something. I know how that feels as a missionary. When God pulls me off of all social media, sometimes I'm like, God, does anybody know I'm hungry today? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or something, whatever. I, I don't need food money uh, today, but I remember last year I needed food money. 
I was in Crete, Greece, and I needed food money. And God told me uh, to write the Muslim over in Kuwait and ask him for food money. I'm not kidding. God told me exactly who to ask. And you know what? Very, very quickly, this Muslim man in Kuwait sent me money for food. God did not ask me to write a Christian. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know every reason why God does something? Because I sure don't. Look, you can't figure God out. I'm not going to figure God out. It's not going to happen. If you can figure out God, you might as well call yourself God. You're not going to figure out God. He's not going to let you figure him out. And one of the scriptures uh, that I like is, uh, I believe it's from Isaiah, where it, it talks about God doesn't need a counselor. Who are we to counsel God? God doesn't need a counselor. Oh, excuse me, God, I need you to do this for me. Oh, really? Well, I would like to see more patience in your fruit. So I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer. That's probably what he's saying a lot of times. I am working on your character. You'll get it when it's time. In the meanwhile, you work for me. I own you. See, a lot of Christians don't, don't meditate on the fact that God owns you. You're not your own. That's what the whole blood of Jesus is all about. When you accept Jesus Christ into your life, he purchases you with his blood. That's why I don't make it easy for people to go get saved. Uh, you don't see me praying the sinner's prayer with people on every single video. I don't do that. With the camera on or the camera off. Why? Because I don't want a big mess on my hands of a bunch of false converts. Amen. God bless you, Philippines. Amen. Or the Holy Ghost on the Philippines, Jesus, tongues of fire. Um, so when God called me to repent and make a commitment, follow me. In Rome, Georgia, 1996, I knew what that meant. I knew giving my life to Jesus meant letting go of sins I liked. <laughs> Let me just make it plain. Come on, even Dr. Brown says that. Dr. Michael Brown became a Christian very young. And he said when he got born again, it wasn't that he hated heroin. When I got born again, it wasn't that I hated premarital sex. I still liked it. I uh, 
slipped up a few times after I became a Christian. God spanked me too. Early, early within, I think it was the first year of my Christianity. I attempted to sin with a man. And God didn't let it happen. And then one time I did, 21 years ago, I did. I did. Oh, yeah, I did. And let me tell you something about that. I wrote about it in one of my books. Um, but I didn't talk about it for many years. And I'll tell you why. Because Christians will beat you up. There are Christians that... Do not see grace at all. And they look at it like, oh, if you did that, then you weren't saved. No, I was I was born again. I was born again. I just made a horrible, horrible mistake. And after I did it, I was so convicted that God allowed me to feel bad. For that one night stand for 10 months, 10 months of guilt. Why? Because God wanted me to know you can't do this, woman of God, and get away with it. I own you. But what happened was I had watched this video of a woman preacher and she said in the video, if you're going to sin, you might as well go out and, and get a man and do it all night long. That's what she said. I'm not going to say who it was. But I was a young Christian and I heard this woman preacher say, you might as well just go do it. So I watched that and I said, hey, I might as well go do it. And the Holy Spirit was like, how do you feel about doing that? I'm like, I feel horrible. I had so many consequences from that. Because I was called. I was called. I was chosen. I was set apart. The hand of God was on me. And I didn't like it. I like it now. Of course. Obviously. <laughs> God sent me around the world preaching the gospel. What an honor to be an ambassador of Christ. But 21 years ago when God called me. I wasn't too excited about it. I'm just going to tell you right now. And um, I fell with my neighbor, June 1999. But let me tell you something. Because of that, I don't date people. I don't date. Uh, I've been to 67 countries. So when you look at my journey and read my books, you won't see me on a date with an Italian, a date with a Greek man, a date with a, a Ukraine uh, fighter with his Russian glasses on. Okay. You don't see all of that. Why? Because God has saved me from my husband and only my husband. I don't date. Well, how will you know? I'll know. I'll know. My husband gets my first date. Period. I'll know who to give that date to. But I'm not going to go out there and be dating and getting to know people and having coffee and sniffing them out and filling out applications and, uh, you know, interviewing future husbands. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be about my father's business.
But for many, many years, I didn't tell that story because Christians, uh, they would judge me and say, well, you weren't even saved. Yeah, I was because God chastens his children. You didn't know I wrote books. I've written nine books. I've published nine books. But eight of my books were published under my name. I don't talk about my ghostwriter book because that was that was uh, for somebody special, just for him. But uh, yeah, I've published eight books under my name. Uh, inspired by the Great Commission, Volume One, Two, Three, Four. Um, come on, Jesus, let this lag go in the name of Jesus. Man, that was one long lag. That was a long lag. Hi. Um, I have Blessed Are the Risk Takers Part Two. One of my most painful books I've ever written is my women in ministry book. It is, um, it is called how I survived the ministry 17 years as a woman street preacher. I tell a lot in that book. So if you're a woman called into ministry, that's the book to get because I, I, I tell what it's like. Being a single woman and dealing with men, my fat years versus my years where I was more attractive. You get treated different when you're fat and when you're you're more beautiful. I've been doing this 20 years, 19 years as an open air preacher. So I had a man grab me yesterday. And I was like, buddy, I will punch you. You touch me one more time. I ain't even joking. Don't touch me. But this homeless man uh, walking down the street, I'm trying to walk home after my outreach. And he literally grabbed my arm. And I was like, <laughs> look, you see this? I work out every single day. I will punch him, and he'll go flying through the air. He touched me today. I ain't joking. I don't play. If I have to hit a man, I will. Anyway, it fires me up. I, I, you know what? Let me say something good about my hostel. When I got home from my hostel yesterday, I told the guy working here, I said, there's a homeless man out there following me, grab my arm. He jumped up so quick, ran out there to see where that man was. He protect me. Thank you, Jesus. I got. I'm staying at a good place. Yeah. So anyway, I, I'm not reading the comments. Look, sanctification is a process. I believe. But the grace of God is never meant to be an excuse to sin. And so I told what happened to me and how God gave me a spanking. And the reason God gave me a spanking is because there would be other temptations in my future. The Bible says no weapon formed against us will prosper. If you are a single woman traveling the world alone, you will have weapons formed against you, cookie cutter set up perfectly from the devil to try to get you to fall. You don't think the devil doesn't want me to fall? It would be a trophy to Satan to get me to fall, especially after publishing all these books. That's why I have to pull away at times because I'm like, I care about my testimony. 
Yes, I do. I care about my legacy that I leave. I care about what my son thinks about me. I care about what my pastor and my friends think about me. When you fall, you affect more than yourself, especially if you're in ministry. If I fall, I got to think about Joseph and Sinny and my six Bible school graduates. What would I say to them? And there's about to be a seventh graduate from my Bible school. She's over in Sweden taking my classes right now, praise God. So there's about to be seven people uh, in my Bible school. That might sound small to you, whatever. But I'm an ex-crack addict, alcoholic. Anything good happening in my life is a bonus. Because I should be dead. I should be in jail. I should be crazy. But the Lord has saved me, redeemed me, changed my mind. And when I think about the fruit of what God has done in my life, I used to flip God birds. I used to stick my middle finger up at God. And now I'm raising my Bible in the air, calling people to repent. I don't know why God would, you know, that's why I say that because there's people that come on my channel and curse God. This morning I woke up to a guy cursing God on my channel, telling me that God needs to go to the lake of fire for causing all this mess. That's what he said on my channel. And I was just like, I, I ain't even going to let you talk anymore. Because I wrestled with this guy for four days with the scripture. And I was just like, no. I'm going to let God deal with you. And you know what? When God is done dealing with this young man, he may end up a preacher. <laughs> God likes those hard cases. When you look at Apostle Paul, uh, Saul used to be killing Christians. And then he became Apostle Paul, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God loves a challenge. God loves a challenge. So when God says, I want you to go on a 40-day fast for one person, which God did this year. I want you to fast and pray for that man. I'm not going to tell you who I'm talking about either. But God says, I want you to fast and pray for that man for 40 days. I was mad. I was like, I already fasted and prayed for him. I don't want to fast and pray for him anymore. He's your problem, God. No, I want you to lay down your life for this man for 40 days. Okay. Okay. All right. We're called to obey. Christians are called to obey. But God tells you, when God gives you instructions, to do something you do it it's, it's that simple I had a plane ticket to Australia one time and God gave me a dream uh, I don't want you to go to Australia I want you to go to Japan for a month now I could have woke up and argued with God contacted my friends hey what do you think you don't look if God gives you an assignment, you don't need to call your friends and ask them what they think. If you know the voice of God and God told you something to do. Do it. Why would you ask your friend? So what did I do? 
I went to Japan a month. That's what I did. Look, in the natural, it makes no sense. God, you know Australia speaks English, right? God, you know not a lot of people speak English in Japan. You don't think God doesn't know that? God knows that. We're called to obey. And I went to Japan for a month. Had amazing divine appointments. And ate Kobe beef. And let me tell you something. If you've ever tasted Kobe beef, it will make you run to the streets of Japan and dance, because that's what I did. I'm telling you, it was some good stuff. Hallelujah. And I went out there in Kobe, Japan, and danced all over the streets, singing about God making some good steak. <laughs> And people just stopped and watched. Hallelujah. And Pastor Kay laughed. He was with me. He speaks Japanese. Yes, they're the nicest people in the world, most likely. Unless you get on the train. And they're in, if, they're, if the Japanese are late for work, um, no, they're not the nicest people in the world. Because they'll get on that train and push you across the train. Japanese people are addicted to work. And I didn't have coffee that morning. Never leave home without it. <laughs> and I got on that train in Osaka, Japan, with all my luggage. And the train door opened, and it was full. No, it wasn't. Not to the Japanese. It wasn't full. To me, it was full. Hey, they're going to close the door. No, they're not. Let me tell you what's going to happen. The Japanese people got on that train and shoved everybody. Why? Because they needed to go back to work. They're addicted to work. And I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm falling over and my luggage is falling over and I hadn't had coffee. And I'm like, what the heck is going on with these Japan people? <laughs> I missed my bus. I missed my bus. It was horrible. Never forget that day. I got a lot of stories. That's why I've written so many books. And I also wrote a romance novel called um, Inspired by a Wow. And it was a made up love story about me marrying a Dutch Jewish man from uh, one of the Dutch islands. And uh, he got saved at my India crusade. I just made it up. It took me three days to write this love story and, and publish it. So I was telling you about all my books. But that was one of my, that was one of the easiest books I've ever written because it wasn't stirring up pain. The ministry has kind of been painful for me. See, I, I don't know what you see when you watch my videos, but I see it from my perspective. I see everything that happens behind the scenes. You see a clip of a video of me either preaching or talking to people. But I see the big picture. Everything I went through to get there that day 
to deliver a message. If ministry was easy, more people would do it. If living by faith was easy, more people would do it. But it's not easy. And I think that's why God chose someone that had such a bad, bad past that when I think about quitting, Jesus reminds me of rescuing. And I go, oh, yeah. I surrender. <laughs> right? I love that song. Years ago, um, Kim Walker sings this uh, song called I Surrender. No turning back. I've made up my mind. I'm giving all of my life this time. No turning back. I've made up my mind. Your love is worth it. Your love is worth it. Your love makes it worth it. Your love makes it worth it. Your love makes it worth it all. I surrender to you, God. I surrender. Man, I can remember living in the Walmart parking lot in my car for a week. Not moving. I was so broke in California. So poor. And I would walk across the street to the Ruiner Schnitzel because they had a bathroom in the back behind the restaurant. And I would go in there, lock the door. And shave my legs on the toilet. Just so I could be in full time ministry. As I'm singing that song. I surrender. The Holy Spirit reminds me of me shaving my legs there. Out of all the things around the world that I've seen. And I've seen a lot. I went to a wedding in, in uh, Cambodia. I went to a wedding in China. I went to a wedding in Indonesia. I crashed a wedding in the Ukraine. They kicked me out. I said, oh, just trying to see. <laughs> I'm the wedding crasher. Anyway, out of all the things, as I'm singing, I surrender. The Holy Spirit reminds me of shaving my legs, living at Walmart. So God has brought me a long way. That's why I know times and seasons change from experience. When I moved into that car, God knew it was just going to be a few years I would live in that car. And then he was going to launch me to the nations. But see, I don't get to see the end of the book of Angela. When Job was going through the book of Job, Job didn't know in chapter 42 when he prayed for his friends that God would give him double for his trouble. So when I moved into my car, March 17th, 2011, I did not know it would be my home for a while. 
I didn't even know what God was doing. I had never met a woman that lived in her car to be a gospel preacher. So the things God asked me to do many times are pioneer things and forerunner things. Like John the Baptist was a forerunner to Jesus. So forerunners are kind of weird and do things out of the box. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing? Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know, but I sure do feel the Holy Spirit when I sleep in that Honda. And let me tell you something, brother, up there in uh, the Netherlands, Brenda, Netherlands. Let me tell you something. I stood in my son's room. My son is 29. I stood in my son's room next to my mother holding my first published book. And I said, Mom, one day I'm going to Tokyo, Japan with this book. And I'm going to tell the Honda company how I lived in my Honda. My mom just kind of looked at me like, well, okay. And let me tell you something, glory to God. I have a video and photos of me in Tokyo, Japan at the Honda company with my book, telling my story to Honda. God made it happen. God made it happen. Not so God could, like, make my mom think I was cool. I don't know if my mom will ever think I'm cool. Okay? It's okay. I know I'm cool. <laughs> I know I'm cool because of Jesus, all right? I don't know if there's such cool uh, such things as cool Christians, but because uh, Christians are the, the armpits of the world. People don't, you know, typically like them. But anyway, I went, and when I was in there, um, they said, we want to show you a video, and they had this huge screen at the Honda company, and they showed, oh, almost cry when I talk about it. They showed a video of how the Honda Fit was made just for me. That's cool. That's cool. I said, I need to speak to somebody and tell my story. And they were kind of telling me no at first. So I went upstairs and I said, look, you don't understand. I need to talk to somebody that works here and tell my story. Jesus. So they found this man. That was the man that drew the picture and designed the 2008 Honda Fit. And they said, we found somebody to hear your story. You'll be out in a minute. Dude, it was hard. It was very, I'm crying. I'm crying. Because that man came out there. And he used to live in Pasadena, California. I said, I know where Pasadena, California I lived in my car all over California. I know where that is. He said, when we designed the Honda Fit, we never thought about anybody living in it. And I said, well, I'm here to tell you today that there's more people like me out there. <laughs> and you people at Honda, you need to make a car where more people can live in it. He goes, well, I want to show you this video of our van. And I said, no. You need something for people like me. Well, that's got good gas mileage. 
that people don't want a van. They want a car. All right? Good guy. See, Honda Fits are good on gas. I slept all over my country in my car. And would go into Starbucks. Lock the door. Stick my head under the sink. And wash my hair. And I would take sink baths. And sometimes I'd come out laughing. Like, yes. I am free, free, free. I'm in full-time ministry. That's how I felt. That's how I felt. I was like, I'm in full-time ministry. So when people try to get me to come back to America, um, you're asking me to come back to America to live in my car. I don't think so. Not when I got this room and this amazing bed. Come on, Jesus. Look at that nice bed. And no, I don't make up my bed unless I have to. I see no point in making up my bed because I'm going to get in it later. When I get married, I'll make my bed. But uh, I don't see any point in making my bed because I'll get in it later. But, uh, man, God is good. So when I think about quitting the ministry or something, it's like, wait a minute. I've gone too far with you, Jesus. Look, let me tell you something. I'm not quitting the ministry because I want my rewards. Okay. You can take that Christian somewhere else. Jesus is Lord, Harry. Listen up, Harry. Jesus is Lord. You can take that mess somewhere else. Sitting around in your orange pajamas all day, chanting to some dead God. When Jesus died on the cross for you, rose again, Don't come on here with a bunch of get out of your pajamas. Go put some clothes on, get you a Bible, and turn to Jesus. Wasting your time. With these other gods. Wasting your time. I tell you what, the Krishnas get me stirred up. Got demons. Amen. King of kings, Lord of lords, the great I am. Yeah, those Christians, man, they get stirred up. They got my face over there in Amsterdam. They got my face in Helsinki, Finland. Yeah, they do. I ain't scared. I've had so many people up in my face. And the reason I'm not scared is because I've had so many people in my face. It's like just another day in the office for me. It's just another day in the office for me. You need to repent. You need to repent. You got time for your demons. God, I pray for this man right now in the name of Jesus that you deliver him from that wicked religion. Open his eyes. I bind you, Satan, and all your works in this man's life and I ask you to set him free. Open his eyes. Save his soul. We mark you right now with the blood of Jesus. You come out of him, devil, in Jesus' name. I used to preach to uh, Christians, and I say, now there was this other man I was preaching to in Helsinki, Finland. 
And I said, get a garbage can so he can puke up his green demons. <laughs> I mean, seriously, sometimes when you cast a devil out of somebody, they start puking up stuff. They start coughing <coughs> or yawning. That's a sign of a demon leaving somebody when they yawn or cough. Watch out for that. Shoo, Holy Ghost. Fire, 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 fire. Mm. Come on, Jesus. Whoa. Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? You gotta you gotta go out in the power of the Holy Ghost, people. You don't want some demon manifesting and saying, Who are you? God to know you want you want to be right standing with God. I went out with this guy. Oh, oh my gosh, it must have been 1999. He was on the streets, and he struggled with pornography all the time. And I don't know if he thought if he came out with us that that it would help him. To walk in right standing with God more. But man, he went out and preached with us one time. He had a meltdown. He was trying to live for Jesus, but that pornography had a hold on him. And he had to sit down and just grab his head. This is a guy on our team, Team Jesus, having a meltdown. And he just couldn't get that that pornography out of his mind. He had not been set free. He was still, you know, had a grip on his flesh. Yeah, yeah. Had a grip on his flesh. And that's the kind of guy, you know, you, you just, you know, if you're battling like that, you don't need to go do evangelism. Uh -uh. Get your deliverance. Get your get get some freedom. God cares about people. And when and when God saves you, he sanctifies you. And uh, but you you don't need to you don't need to go out there and get in battle if you're if you're if you're all tormented and having these kind of attacks. I remember preaching at a porn conference one time. You know, I came from Tennessee. We didn't have no porn conferences in Tennessee. And um, I didn't, I lived in Dallas, Fort Worth for about four years. I know they had them later, but not while I was there. And so I went with my pastor to preach and inside this convention center was the marijuana convention on the right and the porn convention on the left. And Reuben said, I'm going to stand out here with the banner. You go in and preach to people. And I was like, you want me to go inside? Because being under Reuben's umbrella was like safe for me I was like no nah, I want to hang out with you you're stronger than me but see God was training me for the mission field so my commander in chief Reuben Israel said go inside and I was like okay I was like which which do I go to do I go to after the potheads or the porn freaks like which ones are worse sinners you know because uh the guy that started Salvation Army said, go for souls and go for the worst. <laughs> right? Go for souls, go for the worst. And I'm like, which ones are worse? So I went a few minutes to the potheads, but I, I was like, it's the porn freaks, man. I got to go over there and bug them. And, you know, because I went over there and preached to the porn freaks, I met real famous 
porn stars. Because they told me they were in the movies. And I'm like, wow, I get to preach to celebrity porn stars. <laughs> Praise God. And so they would be right there by the escalator going up to the conference, and I'd get to reach them. I reached uh, uh, several of them. Yeah, praise God. I didn't have my camera and all that. That was before my YouTube channel. And so I remember this one man standing there, and he said, how can I stop? How do I get this out of my head? He wanted deliverance. He wanted free. Praise God. Those that the Son of God sets free are truly free indeed. This man did not want to be tormented by those demons. He knew he was a slave. And so that blessed me that day. I was so glad I went in there just for him. And when I came out, there were all these people lined up for like MTV awards. And the Holy Spirit had me preach to all of them by myself. And that was a day God was really building my faith muscle to preach by myself and do unusual things do new things so now when I travel overseas by myself it's like I'll go anywhere you want me to go Jesus but let me go back to the story of about an hour ago I was starting to tell and I didn't finish it the World Cup story. When I went to the World Cup in Germany in 2014, um, I had on my Israel hat and my Jesus Saves from Hell t-shirt at 10 o'clock at night. And um, I shouldn't have done that. But back then, I was so excited about traveling the nations with the gospel that I didn't use as much wisdom. I was more into crowds and than safety. Now I'm like, I know a lot more after traveling the nations about safety than I did then. And because I'm like, I can handle 500 people. Well, you might be able to handle five pe 500 people by yourself, but don't forget it's Germany full of drinking, World Cup, and Germany is full of Muslims. Okay. All right. And I'm wearing an Israel hat. So I show up, I'm just thinking, hey, I can handle 500 people. Okay, and then these Muslims see me and scream at me, Palestine. And they come after me. And I was like, uh-oh, spaghetti -o. And I said, peace, peace, peace. And I took the hat off and just spoke peace until they calmed down. I didn't get a cool video from my YouTube that day. I got a spanking from God is what I got. Holy Spirit said, don't you ever do that again. <sighs> Not at 10 o'clock at night. I think if it had been 5 o'clock in the afternoon or maybe 7 I would have got away with it, but not at 10 o'clock at night. Don't start an outreach as a woman by yourself at 10 o'clock at night. I 
I did it nine o'clock at night, Eindhoven, two years later, which was stupid. And I got punched in the nose, ended up running from people. The next day I was put in jail for 31 hours. So that was a rough weekend. <laughs> that was a rough, rough weekend. Yeah. Eindhoven. That's over there close to where you are in Brenda. So anyway, look, it was good talking, everybody. But if I'm going to preach today, I'm going to need energy. And that was two hours of talking. And so I need to save my energy for my outreach now. Um, and I definitely think I'm going to get some protein in my body. God, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would release the Pentecostal fire and the Pentecostal tongues of fire, baptism in the Holy Spirit for every hungry thirsty soul here today crying out for more, 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 more of you, God. Pour out your spirit, God, on all flesh and let your sons and daughters prophesy. Let your old men, men dream dreams. Pour out your spirit on your handmaidens. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay. Okay, praise God, everybody. God bless you. I'm going to the streets later. Amen. Off we are saying, little German for you. <laughs> Dewey. Dewey. Dewey.